Many years ago, I, as I'm often privileged to do, was hanging out at a vacation Bible school. And I was closest to the fourth grade, or the four, I'm sorry, the four-year-old class. And one of the little girls came running up to the teacher, and I got to see this whole interchange. And she came right up, and she had tears in her eyes. And the teacher said, oh my goodness, Madeline, what is wrong with you? What is, what is the matter? Why are you crying? Because she, you know, the, when you volunteer for VBS, the first thing you look is like, are they scraped up? Is there blood? You know, that kind of stuff. No, she was fine, but she was crying. She said, what's, what's wrong? She goes, I lost my price tag. Her name tag, you know, made with um, construction paper, hole punched, and then filled with yarn to go around her neck, had actually, because she was running so fast, chasing one of the boys, had flown around her neck, and it was on her back. So Madeline wanted to know, where's my price tag at? And the teacher said, well, first off, here it is. And honey, that's not your price tag, that's your name. You see, we get confused a lot about who we are because we listen so often to all the different noise in our life about who we're supposed to be. There's a lot of it, too. I mean, it's not just, you know, a family of origin or favorite TV shows or, or whatever that bombards us with identity-defining things that we have to decide whether to let in or to reject. So it's important for us during the season of Lent as we think about Christ calling us into a deeper relationship with himself as we remember our baptism and are thankful for the living water of the Holy Spirit which has redeemed us and brought us into right relationship with God. That we as Wesleyan Methodist Christians in our heritage are well aware that we have an obligation too in responding to that grace. It's an important time for us to reclaim so, so much of that. But names tell us who we are. And I don't just mean where if you do a quick Google search of somebody's name and it says, well, this is Hebrew for this, or this is Latin that means that. Those are very important. And, of course, when people are baptized in the ancient world, there was a new name given or the name of a saint that they took up to, to uh, be a new creation. Of course, that's what we're looking at as well today. And the idea of a name. But God has a lot of names. And in the Bible, God's names are revealed to us and they show us God's nature. So God is El Shaddai, the strong one. El Eloin, uh, God Most High, El Olam, the Everlasting God, Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, Jehovah Rophe, the God who heals, Jehovah Shalom, the God of peace, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Shema, the God who is there, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord our banner, and God is Jehovah Roy, the Lord our shepherd. God's got a lot of names. But if you're infinite, you need a bunch, don't you? So are we supposed to follow in that and be known by many different things? At first glance, I I don't think so, and I think we'll we'll make that more clear in in a minute. But God is revealed to us in names. Now, God is also revealed to us in actions because each one of these names follows or precedes an action that God does that backs it up, too. So there is a sense of a name that defines you or you identify with, and then an action that verifies it. That in all things of the true name of who you really are, it is also how you really are. So God teaches us by God's own nature that to be who he is, who God is, is also to back it up with how God acts. But we have a lot of different things in our life. I mean, we've got all kinds of things that define us, or we choose to define. We, we wear colors and brands. We wear colors of favorite teams. We will get into arguments with people from opposing teams. 
I've heard a lot of people talk about Patriot fans around here. I know. I've seen it. It happens. You know, they're, it's hard to say that, but Patriot fans are children of God, too. But in all lightheartedness, there, is, there are some other issues that are a little more serious than sports fanaticism, where we define ourselves based on ideological, political, sociological lines, and we say this is a line in the sand. If you're not on this side of the line, then you are less than. And the whole purpose of this Lenten season, the whole purpose of this Sunday's worship service is to remind us that those categories and those lines are not defined, nor are they uh, drawn by God. That's us. We compartmentalize. We decide what goes in, what fits in the one box, because we can't handle the chaos. We can't handle more than one name. <laughs> but God can. So God's trying to teach us to see each person as a child of God. We call ourselves by names to identify our allegiances and our loyalties. When we come to Christ and we are baptized, because that's that first step into true discipleship, is baptism and the proclamation of accepting the gift of grace through Jesus Christ. And so when we do that, we go through some words. According to the grace given to you, will you remain faithful member? Will you remain faithful? This thing you're taking now, will you stick with it? Will you remain faithful, a member of Christ's holy church, and serve as Christ's representative in the world? Will you live in such a way that you reflect who Jesus Christ is in the way that you choose to live outside the walls of the church? Right there in the baptismal vows. What comes up after that is on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sin? And every person that's ever been baptized says, I do. Have you ever thought about that, what that really means? Do, do you reject all the garbage that's said about people that says they're not children of God? Do you reject the garbage that's been said about you that you're not a child of God? See, as we are freed ourselves we are then called to help free others from the sense of oppression. I do. Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you to resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves? And we all answered, I do. I mean, we can unpack this stuff for hours, which we're not going to. But it's just the reminder of how deep the vows we took. Do you think a vow said in the presence of God is binding? Do you think God holds you accountable to what you vow? Do you think God counts on you living up as best as your ability will permit you? Or resetting and receiving grace when you fall short? Yeah. This is serious stuff. You get baptized, you make a promise before God and before a congregation that this is what's going to happen. And if you answer for someone else on their behalf, then you become responsible to create an environment where they are able to live into that until they can answer for themselves. Do we look at our baptismal vows and do we live into them? Is, is this a goal? Is this something that is in front of us daily that says, this is who I really need to be today, Lord. I need to be someone who lives into this. Because I am a child of God. I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior, put your whole trust in his grace, and promise to serve him as your Lord in union with the church which, which Christ has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races? That was also an idea. It is so very important that we understand that these are not hollow words, but part of our own sacred tradition of organizing our faith in a way that we can live it out together. Not ultimately perfect, not without error, not without mistake, but with a heart that with each passing day attempts to be more pure than the day ahead. A heart that always looks to define things under the categories of God. A heart that says, I will love first, 
and categorize second. A heart that says, I will look into the, the eyes of the stranger, of the other, and I will see someone in the imago dei, Latin for image of God. Genesis, God says, and we will make humanity in our image. Not, we're going to make some humans in our image, and other ones we're just going to kind of scatter around over the centuries. That each human being that draws breath, which also in the ancient Hebrew tradition, the very word for breath is a name of God. Ruach, which means air or breath. Are we, are we taking this stuff seriously? That we are being defined by it? Is it a name that we are living into? Because when we come to Christ, when we are baptized, we are baptized in His name. I baptize in your name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what I say. I baptize in your name of the triune God. So when we take on that name, in baptism, you become, we can put all kinds of things there, a new creation, as Paul would say. You become reminded of forgiveness. You become filled with grace. You become reset, ready to love. Baptism can mean all those things, but what it really means is you become Christian. And the I-A-N on Christian means belonging to. You say, oh yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh, so you belong to Jesus Christ. You serve him. You take on his name such that the way you live your life is at your best, as the best you can muster, to live his ways. Are you a Christian? Do you follow Jesus Christ at such an intimate level that you do your best to take on his name? Have you received the gift of his grace that redefines you, that frees you, that, that breaks up all that stuff that others have, might have said about you over the course of your life. The things that, that might have defined you, that you might have even believed about yourself, to say, well, I've done this, this, and this, and I, I can't really, I can't really consider myself a person worthy of grace. Well, then maybe you need a new name. Maybe you need to be a Christian. Maybe you need to some, be someone who belongs to Jesus Christ. Because God loved this world so much that he gave his only son. That every person, whosoever, don't you love that old school language? That whosoever shall believe it. Very poetic, also very true. That everyone who believes in Jesus won't die, they will live. Every person. Why? Because every person is a child of God. Every breathing human being on the planet, child of God. In the 1960s, there were a lot of hippies. I don't know if you know that or not, but there were. And outside of San Francisco is a lot of the the hippies were kind of growing up and having families, and they started naming their kids like Moonslice and Skybeam and Flower Petal and, you know, all, all kinds of crazy stuff. So the teachers of the public schools, as some of the hippies would come out of the, the mountains and take their kids to public school, the, the teachers had to be prepared to hear some very odd names. So finally, um, they're kind of going through, and they meet this one little boy, And his name is Flower Stand. And the teacher and the teachers, they just kind of roll their eyes at each other. It's, oh gosh, here's, I, this one takes the cake. Let's start a book. Flower Stand. But they were good teachers, so they worked with Flower Stand. And they said, Flower Stand, it's, it's time for lunch. Would you like chocolate milk or white milk? Flower Stand, it's, uh, it's, it's time for uh, uh, circle time, so let's be sure and get you a, a carpet square. Flower stand, what's your favorite color? And flower stand didn't talk much and looked incredibly confused. Well, I think you'd be confused if your name was Flower Stand, right? All right. 
And so the day finally got to the end, and it was time to put the kids uh, on the buses. And what happens was the kids would have name tags where they would uh, have the location where they were supposed to be you know, dropped off. And so when they looked at flower stand uh, name tag to see where it was that he was supposed to be dropped off, they flipped it around and they said, well, he's supposed to be dropped off at Anthony. <laughs> they flipped his name tag. Poor thing had been called the name of his bus stop the whole dang day and didn't say a word about it. And friends, that spiritually happens to us. We get so caught up with our destination, we forget to claim our name. We get so caught up with this heaven that we don't, none of us can possibly understand anything about it other than it is wonderful. And we rob ourselves of the daily understanding of who we are created to be, who we are called to be, who we are named to be. And that is child of God. So I want to ask you this morning, is your, uh, is your name tag on right? What are you writing down on your name tag? Are you writing down the name someone else gave you? Someone else has imposed upon you? Are you writing down your name? Are you writing down your name with the full knowledge that you are a beautiful, wonderful, wonderful child of God? Because that's the right answer, just in case, if you're not sure. You're a wonderful, beautiful, valued, grace-filled child of God. All you've got to do is recognize it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit.